Welcome to This Is Money podcast, ISA special. I'm Georgie Frost and joining me today is editor Simon Lambert. And coming up, the end of the tax year is fast approaching, which means investors have less than two months to make full use of their ISA allowance. The perfect storm of tougher tax rules and a budget on the horizon, plus increasing savings rates mean we're likely to get a busy ISA season ahead of April's deadline. So Simon will today be telling us how to invest in an ISA why it matters even more now, and how to improve your investing. Plus, could your ISA profit from a chatbot? Don't forget you can stay up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. But first, a message from our Simon. Just to everybody listening here, you need to remember that the point of this podcast is talking about ISA investing and ISA saving. We're going to be talking lots about saving and investing and what you can potentially do with your money. But this is all in very general terms. This obviously isn't financial advice, but it also isn't exactly what you should do. You must do your own research and you must take responsibility for your own finances and deciding what is the right level of risk for you, whether you should save, whether you should invest and all of these other things. And I can't stress that enough. It's really important to remember that, that you're the person who's responsible for your money. And don't just do something because somebody else said that they thought it might be a good idea, whether it's me, Georgie, or anything else that you read, listen to, or watch. Don't forget, you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the Digest and Invest podcast by eToro. Go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go. Digest and Invest by eToro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing. But first, ISA season over the last few years, and a bit longer than that, has been something of a damp squib. But could that be about to change. In the last full tax year, just over 8 million cash ISAs were subscribed, 3.5 million stocks and shares ISAs, and just under 1 million junior ISAs. But what is so good about these savings accounts and why are they especially useful now? Simon, welcome, ISA special. A little bit early, however. Is it too no. early to start <clears throat> thinking about this? No, it's not too early to start thinking about your ISA. In fact, at the time when you should start thinking about your ISA passed many, many months ago. You should have been thinking about your ISA on the 6th of April 2022, because that was the day that you got your new ISA allowance of £20,000. And I'm going to caveat that with the fact that, of course, the vast majority of people have absolutely no hope whatsoever of using up that entire £20,000 ISA allowance. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be thinking about starting to invest early in the tax year rather than leaving it to the last minute. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be starting to think about sheltering your savings from tax earlier in the tax year rather than leaving it to the last minute. In fact, it doesn't mean that you should do anything that means you are leaving it to the last minute because we all know what happens when we leave things to the last minute. Yeah. And I am literally a professional at leaving things to the last minute. I have left things to the last minute so much during my life that I then made a decision to become a journalist because <laughs> that's the career for people who leave things to the last minute. I was going to say we're journalists, Simon. That's what we do. Um, it's like, hey, why did you want to become a journalist? Is it because you love writing? Is it because you wanted to uncover the truth? I said it's because I'm help nosy. help explain things to people? Is it because you're nosy? It's like, no, it's because I just like, I procrastinate and I leave things to the last minute and I'm terrible at doing things on time. Um, that isn't the real reason, but you know, it does. It, it is funny how that fits in with my life choice, isn't it? But but it, it is tr the if you leave things to the last minute, there is no margin for error for things yeah. to go wrong. And when dealing with opening accounts, moving money, um, having to prove your ID, which is you know one of the bugbears of modern day reality when you go to open an account and all of a sudden it says. Hey, we don't we don't believe you live at that address that you've lived at for X number of years. And then you have to start sending in documents and then you're in a last minute panic. Leaving things at the last minute leads to that. It also, for financial reasons, isn't the wisest move. No. If you start the earlier you start investing, the earlier you can start making gains. Now, there is a scenario where if you pick a certain date, in the past and it might be that if you pick the 6th of april 2022 and you invested a lump sum you would currently be down so you would have been better off leaving it until now 
But actually, you should really be, if you're investing for the long term, trying to invest regularly and getting money going in every month. So just that habit of money going in, you can take advantage of something called pound cost averaging when the market falls. You get to buy more of a certain asset and then you get to benefit as it goes up. And also you lower the risk of putting a lump sum in. And that is one of the key things that people say. The reason why I don't invest my money is because I'm worried about it going down in value. And if you invest a lump sum all in one go, then there is a greater chance that something bad might happen and it might fall in value than if you drip feed your money in. Ta- savings, if we're going to talk about savings as well, you're sheltering your money from the tax ban. Now, this has become more important because savings rates have gone up. And with savings rates going up, the amount that you can have in a savings account before you hit the £1,000 annual personal savings allowance is smaller. But for lots of people, there is no £1,000 personal savings allowance. Mm. There is a £500 personal savings allowance because they're higher rate taxpayers. If you earn more than £50,000 a year, you'll be a higher rate taxpayer and you only get a £500 personal savings allowance. And it, it has become much easier to hit that nowadays. If you put your money into a cash ISA, this is why you should put your money into a cash ISA. If you're going to save in cash, put it in there. It's nice and protected from tax and rates are now better than they were in the past we're going to delve all into this but i feel like we should take a little step back and just do a little 101 about isas how they work the rules what happens if you get the rules wrong why they're generally so popular and then we'll go into sort of why now and what we can do about it and how to get started but let's just do a a 101 simon okay there are five different types of ISA but the two that you really need to know about are the cash ISA and the stocks and shares ISA the cash ISA is for cash savings you put your money in it's just like a normal savings account it is protected by the financial services compensation scheme up to 85,000 pounds per individual per individually licensed bank And that means that you're not going to lose any of that money that you've put in up to that limit. And you will then get paid interest on it. And the great advantage is that that interest will be tax free. If you get more than £500 worth of interest in a year and you're a higher rate taxpayer or £1,000 more of interest in a year and you're a basic rate taxpayer, then you're taxed on that. And if you're a higher rate taxpayer, you're going to lose 40% of everything above the the £500. And if you're a basic rate taxpayer, you're going to lose 20% of everything above the £1,000. Now, inflation, which is high at the moment, most people will have noticed that, means that in real terms, money in cash savings accounts is losing out. So interest on cash savings accounts does not match inflation as it stands. That means that the everything you can possibly do to narrow that gap is really important So you need to get the best possible savings account um, that is right for you. And also you need to not be needlessly giving away some of your interest in tax. So that's a cash ISA. Stocks and shares ISA is a wrapper that goes around your investments, your investment funds, your shares, your investment trusts, your ETFs. And what you do is you invest within that account. And it means that all of your profits, which are known as capital gains, are free of capital gains tax and all of your dividends which are paid out by shares funds investment trusts as a reward to investors not everything pays a dividend but lots of stuff does and over the long term dividends have been shown to be the primary driver of total investment returns so they're really important those dividends are tax free as well and if you don't invest in an ISA then there is a capital gains tax free allowance every year of £12,300 at the moment. And we'll come on to that in a bit. And any gains above that are taxed at either 10% for basic rate taxpayers or 18% for higher rate taxpayers. There's also a dividend tax free allowance, currently £2,000. Come on to that in a minute. Above which, if you are a basic rate taxpayer, you get taxed 8.75%. If you're a higher rate taxpayer, you get taxed 33 0.75% and 
if you are a additional rate taxpayer, if you're lucky enough to be someone earning £150,000 a year or more currently, but that's coming down to £125,000, then you would get charged 39.35% tax on your dividends. Now, if you have your investments within an ISA wrapper, not only do you not have to pay tax on them, you also don't have to declare them on a self-assessment tax return. So it saves you a headache of filling in a form. And also all of your gains can roll up over the years and compound free of tax. And if you do that over the long term, it will make a substantial difference to the amount of money that you end up with in your pot. So those are the two most important and the two most popular. You then have the junior ISA, which is for children. Um, and then is then they then get that money at the age of 18. That can either be a cash ISA or it can be a stocks or shares ISA. You get the lifetime ISA which is designed for first time buyers um, or people saving for retirement outside of a pension. The crucial thing about that is it offers a top up of when you pay money in of 25% of the money that you pay in. And that takes you back to the position you would have been in before basic rate tax. But there are penalties if you take that money out for anything other than a first home or uh, before, you know, an age judged to be retirement, so age 60. Um, and those penalties remove the bonus and can remove some of the money that you put in as well. But if you are saving for a first home and you've never owned a home before, then the lifetime ISA is a really good thing to have. And you have to be under 40 to open one. There's then also something called the Innovative Finance ISA, which is a much less popular ISA, but allows people to invest in things like peer-to-peer investments, it's that market's not really taken off and it's quite niche. Um, so it's one worth considering if you're interested, but not one that we're really going to discuss in detail on this podcast. There's another crucial oh, thing sorry. to remember. You have an annual ISA allowance of £20,000. It's a use it or lose it affair. Once you tick over to the new tax year, it's gone. You don't get to roll over any unused amount. That can be spread in any way you want across a cash and stocks and shares ISA but you can only pay new money into one type of each ISA per year. So, for example, you cannot open two separate ISAs with two separate DIY investment platforms and pay money into both of them in the same tax year. You can pay only pay money into one. With cash ISAs, you can't open two separate cash ISAs with two separate banks and pay money into both of them. With some banks, they do offer like almost like an umbrella that covers different types of savings accounts, but those are quite niche. Um, But you can transfer existing ISA investments into a different ISA as much money as you want and at any time that you want. Is your money locked in? No, you can take the money out whenever you want and that will be free of tax. But you must remember that unless you have something called a flexible ISA, any money that you take out can't be put back in in the same tax year without counting as some of your new ISA allowance. But if you do have a flexible ISA, you could say, for example, take £4,000 out, put it back in in the same year, and it wouldn't count as a new £4,000. I mean, the lifetime ISA thing sounds like a pretty obvious, but for the others, how would you work out what's the right ISA for you? You start from the position that you would do in terms of cash and investment, to be honest, which is Everybody should have their rainy day fund, the emergency money that they need in cash. And the recommendation is that ideally you need three months post-tax wages there, at least. That's to cover if things suddenly go wrong. The boiler goes, the clutch goes on the car. You suddenly need some money and you need to be able to get at that money. So that should be in cash. Money over and above that, that you don't need in the short term. So, for example, um, just money that you are saving in general can be invested, but you need to have a five year time horizon, really, on investing, you know, because the longer you have a time horizon of the less likely you are to find it falls in value due to the market falling. Now, if you are willing to accept that that money that you're putting in when you go to get it out in two years time, in it might be down. 10, 20, 30% if something's gone badly wrong and you can just deal with that, then you can invest over a shorter time horizon. But if that would be a problem, then don't invest the money. So for example, people should be quite careful about investing a house deposit if they know they're going to need that house deposit in a year's time 
or two years time. It can be very tempting because you think, oh, look, the stock market's gone up by 10% over the past year. If I could get 10% more of my money, then my deposit could be up. What happens if something goes wrong? And you don't know when something's going to go wrong. You know, nobody knew the market was suddenly going to fall 30% with COVID. Um, what happens if something like that happens and all of a sudden you've got 30% less? If that's going to be a problem, then you need to think very carefully about investing. But investing over the long term delivers the best long term returns. There are a number of studies that look at this. There are two fam- most famous ones, the Barclays Equity Guilt Study and the Credit Suisse Yearbook. A new one of the latter is out imminently, I believe. But the most recent showed that global markets, so investing all around the world, since 1900, equities, which is what they call shares, so investing in the stock market, outperformed bills, uh, which is cash, basically, by 4.6% per year on average, and bonds, which is government bonds, by 3.2% per year on average. So that illustrates that people over the long term have had a much better return from investing in the stock market. But once you drag it down to over the short term, it, it you know, that that's not guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed. How you then decide what ISA you want is based on that saving versus, versus investing debate. And you have to remember that it's not a, a totally, you know, polar issue. It's not you do one thing or you do the other. People hold cash and they hold investments. And the mix of that is down to their own personal appetite for risk and when they might need the money, um, the other factors that come into play. But it is worth considering investing some of your money over and above that emergency fund you need and any short term stuff. And you can just dip your toe in. You know, you if you say you've got a big pot of savings, you can just start putting some of it into investments to get comfortable with it and see how it goes. And, you know, maybe you like it. Maybe it's good. And you put a bit more in. So, Simon, you mentioned there earlier that you would come back to these topics, capital gains tax, savings rates. We've had the cash ISA being called the comeback king of 2023. Why are all the commentators saying that now is a particularly good time and not too early to start considering your ISA? So if we just deal with cash ISAs very quickly to begin with. The reason why you need to think about putting your money into a cash ISA more now than you did in the past is due to the fact that savings rates have risen. Um, The best easy access savings rate now pays 3.35%, I think. The best one-year fix is paid more than 4%. That is a multiple of the interest that they were paying a year ago. And that means that all of a sudden, more people who have built up over £10,000 or so in savings are going to start risking hitting that personal savings allowance. For many years, rates were so low, most people didn't have to worry about the personal savings allowance. Now more people do. And you don't want your interest being eaten by tax. If you put your money into an ISA, then you don't need to worry about that. So get your cash savings into an ISA if you can. It's just as simple as that. And the good reason to do so now is because rates have gone up. With investments, it's more important now than it has been for some years because on the 6th of April something bad is going to happen in his wisdom the chancellor Jeremy Hunt decided in the autumn statement to slash the annual capital gains tax free allowance from 12,300 pounds that it currently is to 6,000 pounds in the new tax year and on top of that he also decided to slash the dividend allowance from 2,000 pounds to £1,000. So all of a sudden, the amount of money you can make in profits um, from capital gains and the amount that you can get in dividends and not pay tax on it is going to drop substantially. Um, And to put that in context, a higher rate taxpayer making a £15,000 capital gain would currently pay tax on just £2,700 of that profit. So it would land them with a £486 bill. But if they make the same gain after the 6th of April, they would be liable for tax on £9,000 of their profits, meaning a tax bill that would be more than three times bigger at £1,620. From the 6th of April, somebody getting £2,000 worth of dividends would go from the situation where currently they pay no tax on them 
to paying £337.50 if they were a higher rate taxpayer. So you can see how it eats into people's returns. And there's worse news down the line because the capital gains tax allowance is going to fall again from £6,000 to £3,000 in 2024. And it's the dividend allowance is going to fall again from £1,000 to just £500 in 2024. So you can see how it's being ratcheted up that this is much, much more important for people. And lots of people are going to listen to this and go, when am I ever going to make £12,000 in capital gains? That's loads of money. Selling investments, £12,000. But you know what? There are also lots of people who have long-term investments that have built up over the years. And if they look at their investment portfolio, they would discover that if they sold, you know, off chunks of their portfolio, they would face a capital gains tax bill. And it's not just if you're selling your investments and then taking the money out of your portfolio. It's if you're selling your investments to buy other investments. So, for example, maybe you bought some BP shares in late 2020 you thought the oil price is so low bp shares are now so low that they can only possibly go up the world is going to recover from this pandemic at some point and when that happens the oil price is going to shoot up and bp's profits are going to shoot up instead of making a colossal loss and these shares people are going to recognize are colossally undervalued and they're going to go up substantially in value Right now, you might have bought ten thousand pounds worth of BP shares, for example. A lot of money, but there's quite a lot of people out there who might do something like that. You would now be sitting on a capital gain of about fifteen thousand pounds. So, all you, there you go. One thing has triggered this capital gain. You'd also, you know, if you've built up a portfolio over the years, potentially be risking dividends that are topping that dividend allowance so it really pays to get your money into an ISA and also this is a way that you can use up your ISA allowance without having to have £20,000 in new money to pay in because as I said most people can't save or invest £20,000 a year if you've got existing investments you can do a thing called a bed and ISA where you sell your investments and then you buy them back within an ISA and that means that you're using up some of this year's ISA allowance and you're sheltering those investments into an ISA. And this is a really important thing for anybody who has got investments outside of an ISA to consider doing before the 5th of April 2023, which is just over a month away. Do not leave this until the 5th of <laughs> April 2023. If you are listening to this and you are thinking, that might be me. I might need to get some of my investments into an ISA. This might be a good idea. Really don't leave it until the 5th of April. Don't leave it till the 4th of April. Don't even leave it till the 3rd of April. Please do something about it mm. before then. And I hold my hands up here. I have got investments that are held outside an ISA. And the reason why people do this, okay, is because the ISA system is not set up to benefit the customer in the way that it could be. And it's this issue of not being able to pay new money into two, di into two of the same type of ISA. So some types of ISA investment account might be better for funds. Some might be better for shares. And, so, and because of like people thinking in pots, people invest outside of an ISA with some money and inside of an ISA with others. So I've got some money invested outside of an ISA and some inside it. And I need to get that outside of an ISA money into an inside of an ISA thing because otherwise I'm going to be risk risking a much bigger tax bill down the line. And feel free to ask me a week before yeah. the, 6th, the 5th of April, 6th of April, whether I've actually done anything about this and scold me if I haven't. You know, I'm good at that, Simon. Um, before we move on to the practical elements of how to get started and how to maximise your stocks and shares, ISA, how to make the most of it, take it to the next level and all that jazz, we've got a budget coming up. There's been some sort of kite flying, one might suggest, uh, caps on ISA limits and all that sort of thing. Are you expecting any changes? I wouldn't think so, only because of the sheer level of changes that were made and the tax raise that happened in... The autumn statement, I mean, we we sort of went with the headline, I think, on the podcast that week of the everything tax raid. Um, but there is a possibility. I mean, there, there was this idea floated that um, there should be a cap on the amount of savings investments you can have in your ISA so that, you know, they could then divert some of the tax relief that is there from not 
charging people tax towards those lower down the scale who need more help to save and invest because ultimately we are talking about wealthier people who benefit from this the most you know anything could happen but i would hope that jeremy hutton has done done his worst here because that cutting of the capital gains tax allowance and the dividend tax free allowance is, is quite a substantial hacking away at two key you know allowances for investors and i would like to think that you know the isa is is almost sacrosanct in a sort of like just don't mess with this because the message that gets put out to people or the message that people take actually maybe not the message that's meant to be put out to people the message people take is like what's the point in saving they're just going to keep changing the rules and tax me wherever they can and i think that changing the isa system would lead to an absolute you know barrage of that kind of sentiment and be a very very bad move all right that's it for part one I'm joined now by Sam North of eToro for our weekly update on what's been going on on the markets. Sam, how have the markets been this week? Hi, Simon. Yeah, it's actually been a relatively quiet week on the news front, uh, but following the slightly hotter than expected inflation reading we had not too long ago, we've seen a bit of a re- repricing in markets. So we're, we're currently on course for a third down week in a row. Uh, for the most traded stock market in the world, the S&P 500, which may scare a few people. But in in truth, I feel it was needed. We had such a strong start to the year that we needed to reprice a little bit before we could potentially go higher. Uh, And things, I think, are going to get a lot more interesting in the next couple of weeks. So the next leg up, that that could well happen in the next few weeks. In specific stock news, we saw a big push high for NVIDIA follow their, following their earnings. And there's been a lot of talk about Meta and Meta Verified. Uh, and investors are just digesting that at the moment. And what do we have on the cards for next week on the markets? Yeah, well, well just like that, on Tuesday, February will be done. Uh, we enter the last month of the quarter. Uh, typically, the last couple of days of the month can lead to quite choppy trade. Uh, and there is also nothing too major coming out on the Monday or Tuesday on the macro front. However, Wednesday to Friday, a few bits and pieces that we should keep our eye on. You've got manufacturing data out of the States, Eurozone inflation and unemployment rate on uh, Thursday to, to front the bill there. Uh, earnings season continues, albeit a lot of the big names have already come out. However, for those that are interested, Broadcom, Costco, Salesforce and Target all report next week. On the front of it, I, I really do expect a relatively chilled five days before things get a little bit more interesting and juicy the week after. Sam, thank you very much. We'll join you next week for another update. Thank you, Simon. Welcome back. This is the ISA special. So let's delve into the practical elements, shall we? How to get started with stocks and shares ISA. We'll talk about how to take it to the next level shortly. But for those who never invested in an ISA before, perhaps lack a bit of confidence, maybe have, not really sure. How do you pick an investment platform? What should you be looking out for? Even if you're not an unconfident uh, or first timer, this is probably quite useful for everybody. This is the first hurdle isn't it? This is where you can fall down. There are a lot of different people offering you stocks and shares ISAs. The main way that many people will open a stocks and shares ISA is through an investment platform. These are companies that offer you investing accounts and they offer a variety of different types. So there's a big market in what we would term the the DIY investment platforms where they offer you a stocks and shares ISA, where you get to pick your own shares, investment trusts, funds, any investment that you want, and you hold it within that ISA wrapper. And you manage your money online, on their app, or you can do it over the phone if you want to, although you will find that it's more expensive. They are a a great way to invest, and they have dramatically slashed the cost of investing. The big names here, Hargreaves Lansdowne, Interactive Investor, Best Invest, Fidelity, AJ Bell. And then you come in hot on their heels, you've got some smaller players. Free Trade, for example, has been very popular with younger investors. Now, most of these individual platforms will also offer you assistance in picking your funds, shares, investment trusts, etc. if you want it. 
Now, that doesn't necessarily have to take the form of financial advice, which will cost you extra money. It will take the form of things like model portfolios, um, whereby it may or even sort of one size fits all funds, whereby all you have to do is go, that sounds like me and I want to put my money into this. And it's as simple as opening an account with one of these platforms, paying your money in and then choosing your investment and actually it's important to remember that you don't have to choose your investment straight away you can just pay your money in to get it in there this tax year and then invest it but don't make the mistake of just leaving the money sitting in there in cash um rather than and and never investing it um if you want to read our guide to the best diy investment platforms go to thisismoney.co.uk forward slash platforms where we look through all of the names that i mentioned before and others including people like charles stanley and so on there's lots and lots of different things there are also what was termed robo advisors. Sometimes they're called online wealth managers, um, digital wealth managers, things like that. And these are platforms that rather than being set up to let you choose from the full menu of investments on offer, will do some form of profiling on you where you answer some questions and then it suggests what type of investor you are and then will present you with a portfolio that suits that kind of investor this isn't personalized in the way that financial advice is okay this isn't somebody actually looking at your individual finances and then going right this is what you need to do um this is a you know a kind of like a, a a bracketing or bucketing exercise it's like this is a for people like you kind of thing but these can be really useful ways of investing um we've got companies like nutmeg like money farm who do things like this um uh wealthify is another one and if you just want to invest some money um and you don't really want to pick where that money goes but you want to just benefit from you know investment then this is a, a solution that you could take but you need to bear in mind that it will cost you more money than just opening a simple um diy investment platform account and those diy investment platform accounts will charge you potentially for buying and selling investments and also an annual admin fee which may be charged as a percentage of your investment or it may be charged as a flat fee um but if you open an account with most of them and then you invest into the most simple thing which is a global stock market tracker fund you can get your investing costs down to a really quite low level and make it really quite simple what's a ballpark figure for fees what what's the figure that you would be looking at and bulking and some that you might think oh yeah yeah no that's decent well i mean it, it depends so for example interactive investor which charges a flat fee it charges a monthly fee mm-hmm. um for its isa account it now charges um 9.99 per month but it then gives you back five pounds 99 per month in a free trading credit so if you're using that to buy an investment once a month, then you're effectively only paying four pounds a month. Mm-hmm. Or alternatively, you could do regular investments, which only cost, um, which 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 are free within the platform. So you just set it up every month. You pay some money in, and then it you buy these investments. It's brought in a new offer for investors who have less than thirty thousand pounds, where it charges them just four pound ninety nine a month. So if you look at that, you know, what you're looking at, £5 a month times 12, £60 a year. If you go to someone like Hargreaves Lansdowne, they operate a different system whereby they charge a percentage of your investments, which is 0.45% per year. Now, if you only have a small amount of investments, and this is this is on, um, you know, all of your investments, but there is a cap if you hold shares, trusts or ETFs of £45 a year. Now, if you only hold shares, trusts or ETFs, and you have a larger amount, that £45 cap makes it quite cheap. If you only hold funds and you have a small amount, that 0.45% might make it cheaper, for example, than paying the monthly fee to Interactive Investor. But if you have a larger amount, it might make it more expensive. So generally speaking, you need to think about how those fees measure up. Um, They're at the more expensive end, um, whereas someone like... um, Charles Stanley is 0.35%. Um, AJ Bell is 0.25%. Vanguard, which is a bit different because it, it only allows you to invest in Vanguard's own funds, many of which are very simple, cheap tracker funds, 
that only charges 0.15%. But as I said, if you go to thisismoney.co.uk forward slash platforms, you will find all of this information and a rundown of what these different ones do. And then what you need to do is choose the one that you think is, is right for you. While we're on platforms, what about those who already have an investment ISA? Should you move platforms? What do you need to watch out for here? Well, it is something to consider because the market changes and pricing changes. And the also, you shouldn't just do it on pricing. You should do it on what people are offering you in terms of uh, customer service and also how well that platform works. And it, it, there is a scenario where you could build up an ISA with one platform and discover that actually you could be saving a substantial amount by moving it to a different one. So you should consider that you should look at those charges. You should also consider whether you're happy with the service as well. And you should think about moving and you can transfer your money. And actually in actual fact, you can transfer some of your ISA in many cases into a different ISA account and leave some of it or still keep the, uh, the account open with the old one. Um, but what you must remember is that don't pay new money into more than one ISA in any given year. So if you do end up with two different stocks and shares ISAs, don't pay £500 into one one month and then £500 into another another month because then you've broken the rules. OK, let's say we're going DIY then. How do you pick your investments? Should you use a best funds list? Well, I think the problem for many people, this is the second hurdle. You've got your money into your investment platform and then you need to decide where to invest it. And there's a lot of different companies on the stock market and investing in individual shares comes with a heightened risk because what you need is a diversified portfolio of at least 15 to 20 different shares. And they need to be companies that do different things um, and don't all get affected by the exact same issues. So, you know, 15 to 20 companies that all do similar things is not a diversified portfolio. So for many people, you're better off choosing an investment fund, an investment trust or an ETF. These are all pooled investments which take investors money. They put it together and they invest into a certain thing. The simplest of them are what's known as tracker funds um, or index funds. And they just follow a set index, which might be a stock market, for example. So you could get a FTSE 100 tracker. You could get a FTSE all share tracker which which tracks the entire uk stock market you could get an s p 500 tracker which tracks the us s p 500 or you can get a global tracker which is probably the starting point that most people should be at which invests in the global stock market so all around the world the world's most successful companies you're putting your money into all of them and that means that you've got the broadest possible investment and then you can use that as the core of your investments and then maybe start to invest in some other stuff around the side. And those can be you know, very, very cheap. If you look at funds and investment trusts, active funds and investment trusts, that's when you have a fund manager who is choosing investments that they think are going to beat the market. This is a very, very difficult thing to do. And also, it might look like someone's really good at it. And then it suddenly turns out that they're not. You could beat the market for three or four years um, and then you could not beat it for another 10. But after those two or three years in of that three or four year stint, lots of people are going, hey, this guy's a girl's a genius. I'm going to definitely put all my money in with them. But the risk of trying to beat the market is that also you can fall behind the market. So you have to pick active funds and investment trusts very, very carefully. Um, that's not to say that they don't have their place and you you're talking to a man who's got lots of active funds and investment trusts in his portfolio. I know all of the arguments for passive tracker investing, yet I still think I can pick the people who think that they can beat the market. Am I right? Who knows? It's very difficult to tell. Quite often I'm wrong. Sometimes I'm right. Um, but that's just the way that I choose to invest. But again, it's not an all or nothing affair. Mm -hmm. You could have most of your investments in a nice broad tracker fund and just pick some of those fund managers around the side to top it up with to go back to your question around best funds lists because there are so many different things that people can choose from the investment platforms compile lists of funds that they think best in class stand out if you're going to buy something this is what good looks like they are not the be all and end all of what you should invest in but if you are looking for a guide as to what might be a good investment then they definitely 
are useful and have their place. There have been issues in the past whereby some of them featured funds that then turned out to be absolute duds. The mm. most famous blow up was Neil Woodford, who remained on Hargreaves Lansdowne's list for arguably far too long and had a very long track record of being a very good investor until everything went very, very badly wrong because he went very, very off piste with what he was doing. Um, But I do think that the best funds lists are well worth having a look at. Don't just look at one, though. Look at them across different platforms. And most of these are totally free for you to access. You don't have to have an account to see them. So have a look at a couple and, and, you know, draw up your shortlist that way. All right, so that's getting started. What about taking it, Simon, to the next level? You have an article on your website in which experts that you've asked have given their last-minute fund and trust tips for income and growth-seeking investors. So what are the experts saying? Right, so this is an example of things that are coming from best funds and trust lists. So um, Interactive Investor uh, have a, a their own list. It's the Super 60. Uh, best invest they have their own list too um there and i think it's just called best funds list does what it says on the tin very ron seal um and within it they pick what they they think is best now uh for example uh we spoke to jason hollands of best invest now jason thinks that the uk stock market looks pretty good value at the moment even though it has hit a record high of over eight thousand recently and also that it is one of the major leading markets for dividends. And he said that in that case, he believes that UK equity income funds, which are funds that invest in UK shares that pay a dividend, deserve a place as a core holding in portfolios. Now, you can choose not to get those dividends paid out for you. They can roll up within the fund. They compound over time and you get that long term investing effect from dividends. Um he highlighted BlackRock UK Income, which invests in large UK companies and middle sized UK companies. And it looks for attractive, consistent cash flows through economic cycles, which will lead to long term dividend and capital capital growth. So they pay lots of attention to the companies within it. Interactive Investor, on the other hand, highlighted four funds from its Super 60 list. Artemis Income, Vanguard FTSE UK Equity Income, that's a track fund. Man GLG Income Professional, Janus Henderson UK Responsible Income. Okay, now within some of the other stuff, they also talked about Investment Trust, Murray International, uh, and also another Investment Trust, City of London, uh, whereas Jason Hollands recommended an Investment Trust called Temple Bar, which has been doing quite well recently after new managers came in, and it looks for good companies, strong balance sheets that are trading at cheap valuations and if you want to watch uh ian lance explain how temple bar invests then i did an investing show with him a few months back where he talked through some of these things and you can find that at thisismoney.co.uk forward slash investing show but what i would say is that then there are also lots of other investments you could choose so they looked at growth investments too so they highlighted something called lion trust uk growth fidelity special situations templeton emerging markets but you should never ever invest just on the basis of reading an article like that or listening to me list funds which is why i did it quite quickly in a way that hopefully nobody could get down all of those names and then go off and buy them you need to look at these individual investments yourself look at what they do and work out whether they are right for you in terms of where you want to invest and also the type of risk that you are willing to take because some of them will be higher risk some of them will be lower risk and then you also need to look at every single one of them if they are an actively managed fund and ask yourself the question, is there a tracker fund that can do this job equally as well and for a cheaper price? And then you can make the decision as to whether you put the money into the tracker fund or into the um, the actively managed fund. And you also need to remember that if you look at the, the global stock market, um, the more you veer away from that, the more of an active choice you are making in that you think you can beat the market. And so if you suddenly end up with 80% of your money in the UK, then you are making a massive bet on the UK stock market outperforming the global stock market because the global stock market is roughly 60 to 65% US. 
well, talking of US, you ask in the article, is it a good time to invest in the in the US? Nobody really knows. I mean, the you know, it, 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 the US market did spectacularly well for many years and then fell off its perch spectacularly last year when big tech shares got an absolute walloping, when interest rates went up more than people thought they were going to go up. And people suddenly realized that money wasn't going to be as cheap as it was forever. And that impacted their view on how much they were willing to pay for companies that were promising jam tomorrow rather than making profits today. It might be that some of those shares have now fallen enough that they represent good value, or it might be that things have changed for some of them. Um, Facebook, for example, Meta is a profit making machine. It's still a profit making machine. But Mark Zuckerberg is making a very, very large and expensive bet on the metaverse he might be wrong there and so the thing that made facebook such an incredible profit making machine over the last five to ten years which was basically advertising on facebook's social media platforms is now still the absolute bulk of the business but at the same time those profits and some of the resources and some of the money and some of the money is being eaten into by Zuckerberg's huge bet on the metaverse. And, you know, that changes the game for investing in Facebook shares. So don't just look at Facebook stroke Meta's share price now and go, well, it's a long way below what it was. So that must be cheap because actually something has changed in that situation. The Facebook business model is not the same business model that it was two years ago. Talking about taking it to the next level, how do you give your investments an overhaul? What are some of the common traps and mistakes and how can you avoid them? Some of the common traps and mistakes or one of the most common traps and mistakes for people who've investing for some time is ending up with some kind of crazy magpie portfolio where over the years they've seen something that they think looks like a good opportunity or a good investment. and They've added it to their portfolio and then they've seen something else and they've added that and they rarely sell one investment in order to buy another investment. They just add an investment in here, add an investment in there. And all of a sudden, your portfolio ta- starts to take a very different shape to the one that perhaps it started out with or perhaps even the one that you think it has. And you could end up also with a very long list of investments that you have no hope whatsoever of managing to keep track of. And I will hold my hands up here as being one of these people. I've been investing for, I don't know, like 10, 15 years on my own personal account. And over that time, I've built up investments. And the problem is, is because a lot of investment platforms, in fact, the vast majority of them, you just hold it all in one long list when you look at it. And it doesn't allow you to put it into pots. So, for example... About 10 years ago, I had this idea that I was going to try to build up a a portfolio of shares and I was going to have those individually selected shares. I'm going to see how they did against my other investments. They weren't the bulk of my investments, but they were a small part of my investments. When I look at my investment account, they're all just mingled in with all the other stuff, with all the funds and the investment trusts. What I really want to see is I want to see a picture whereby I've got the, the core part of my portfolio which is I can go, right, that's doing that. And then I've got this smaller part and I can see what that's doing. But then also I invest for my children and I don't invest for them via a junior ISA. I just invest in them through my own ISA because I can't fill up my own ISA anyway. And I think that's a better way of doing it for my personal situation than through a junior ISA. Um, so then the investments I've made for them are mixed up in it as well. And it, And when I look at my investment portfolio it's just this big long list of stuff and i'm just like it's very difficult to unpick there is a part of me that thinks maybe i should just set fire to the whole thing chuck everything out the window sell everything and then start from a position of buying back the problem is is that isn't really that practical because a it's expensive because you have to pay dealing fees to sell the investments and all of a sudden they rack up and you think hang on a minute i don't want to pay like 250 quid to sell all this stuff (laughs) and then secondly you start looking down the list and you go oh yeah but that thing now you see that's down quite a lot and i think that might go up so i'll probably hold on to that bit and that one well that's such a small amount of the portfolio now there's no point selling it i might as well hold on to that so you need to be very disciplined about this because there's lots of ways of stopping yourself 
Um, and I think that what you need to do is you need to give yourself some time. You need to sit down, you need to make a list, you need to look at each investment. You need to say, would I buy this investment now? And if you wouldn't buy that investment now, you should perhaps consider selling it because there is such a thing as opportunity cost. And by sitting there in investments that it might be quite small, or they might be quite old, you might think they might go up in value, there is the opportunity cost of investing in something better. To give an example of this, Lloyds Bank gave its reports today. I've got Lloyds Bank shares. I've got Lloyds Bank shares because I was just old enough when Halifax demutualized from being a building society to end up with Halifax shares. That then ended up with Lloyd, being Lloyds Banking shares during the financial crisis. And then they did a rights issue at a really, really cheap price. And I was like, well, I might as well buy some of those because, you know, as an existing shareholder, I couldn't. They must go up in value. There's many times over the years I've talked on this podcast about how Lloyds, yes, yeah, definitely go up in value, definitely go up in value, definitely go up in value. And then something happens and they go back down again. They've basically gone pretty much nowhere in all of that time. I have been picking up a dividend for the last however many years, but I have also been losing out on the opportunity to put that money into an investment that could have done much, much better over the years. So that's maybe something people will need to think about. And in terms of just one thing, in terms of those that pot idea of thinking about it, one way around this is you can use something whereby it's not your investment account, but you put the information into something else and model it. Now, people can do that on a piece of paper. They can do it in a spreadsheet. They can also use This Is Money's Power Portfolio service, which means it's an investment tracker service. And within that, you can allocate certain pots. So I could see that this is my share investing pot. This is my core ISA pot. This is my kids pot. And so you can see how those individual things are doing. All right. Finally, Simon, is this a bit of a cautionary tale? Could your ISA profit from a chat bot? AI currently the hottest trend in the world of tech and the launch in November of chat GPT, an advanced chat bot that uses AI to complete all manner of tasks, has made headlines around the globe. Now, the growing investment interest in AI has suddenly been taken to a whole new level. So how can you get involved in the excitement without risking it all on high octane firms? And indeed, should you, Simon? Maybe if you want to, with a small amount of your money. But as you said, cautionary tale here. I've just suddenly thought maybe we should have asked chat GPT this question. Well, I've heard that it can be quite biased, actually. So I imagine it's probably going to say something favourable to itself. No, surely. Talk its own AI book. Yeah, up. in a subtle yeah. way. Have yes. you ever asked Siri or Alexa, which is better? I asked Alexa the other day, are you better than Siri? And I think she said something very diplomatic along the lines of each platform has its own benefits or something like that. And we can't possibly decide. I thought, I, I refuse to use Siri or Alexa because I don't want them spying on me. Oh, and good. I think, I think Simon, that, by, that ship I think, has sailed. Everybody knows I, anything about yeah, you I know, anyway. I know. I think that by asking them, by using them, I'm therefore like triggering them to then start spying on me. I mean, obviously, Apple and Amazon will tell you this this isn't happening but you've got the suspicion that whether you trigger them by asking them a question or not they're just constantly listening and spying on you anyway haven't you well so, good luck to them because it's a really really boring boring existence they yeah must so have. we don't have any we don't, on ha me. <laughs> we don't have we don't have any Alexa stuff in the house I only got the last couple of months house. I was no. the same as you I was the same as you Simon I was like no I don't want to and then I just thought you know what everyone knows everything about me anyway and not because I just gas on about it. It's because think about all of the information that we put out there. Yeah, yeah, it's true. No, 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 it's absolutely. It's all out there anyway. Yeah, I'm sure it would be very easy to to jigsaw it all together. I mean, I don't have I, I don't have TikTok on my phone for the same reason. I mean, you know, there's lots of cautionary stuff said about that, the amount of data that TikTok harvests, isn't there? But yeah, I, I wouldn't allow TikTok either. But you know, it, it, again, it's probably a, it's like shouting into the wind king canute sitting in his chair watching watching the waves roll in to, to actually to prove that he couldn't stop the tide I, you know um so yeah but back to investing yeah, sorry, in, yes. in, in ai and chat gpt this is a classic example of of a story that suddenly catches fire and everybody's talking about it and everybody's talking about how it's going to suddenly you know it's going to really change things and you need to get in on the ground floor the risk of that is that you end up over allocating your money and taking too much risk and getting too involved in something that could effectively then blow up. And there are various ways of trying to back AI. And a lot of them that are very tempting to people will involve small, high risk, early stage companies 
that are highly volatile and could suddenly make massive gains and then absolutely fall off a cliff. And it's really easy to get caught out by that kind of investment. There are ways of investing um, that are a slower burn, you know, in much larger companies. For example, Microsoft is heavily back in this kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, perhaps that makes Microsoft a better investment now than you might have thought it was a year ago before you'd heard of chat GPT. I spoke to Stephen Yu of the Blue Whale Growth Fund for an investing show. You know, Stephen thinks that AI is, is quite an exciting scenario and he thinks that this is an opportunity for Microsoft. But he also thinks it's quite bad for Google, for Alphabet, because he argues that this changes the game slightly for Google. Because at the moment, up until now, the main risk to Google has been other people trying to do what Google do. And that has been wildly unsuccessful for many people i think it's safe to say bing for example totally failed to make a dent and that had the heft of microsoft behind it duck duck go you know people use it i mean it's ab i keep seeing advert adverts for it but you know the vast majority use google and will continue to use google and the more people who use the way google works is the more people who use it the better it is and it makes it better at finding stuff than the other things and so on and so on. You know, that, that's how the algorithm works. Chat GPT does sort of change it because that's not just somebody trying to, you know, out Google Google. It's somebody offering people something different. Now, that's not to say that, you know, Chat GPT or AI powered search is going to totally topple Google. But if Google goes from 90% of the search market to 70% of the search market, that fundamentally changes the uh, expectations for Google as an advertising based business based on the fact that it dominates search. So, you know, those are things to think about. But, you know, suddenly punting a load of your money into risky small cap AI shares and, and companies claiming some kind of AI thing is a very, very dangerous kind of high octane game. But that's not to say that you shouldn't have a small part of your ISA to invest in this kind of stuff, you know. Maybe you've got your ISA and then you've got 5% of it that you go, that's my, that's my fun pot. That's my interesting stuff pot. And it, you know, I'm going to accept that some of the stuff in there could go to absolute zero. The temptation for people is, is that they see large returns from that stuff. And then they go, oh, I wish I put more money in. I wish I put more money in. Mm. And they start to over allocate to it. All right, then that's it. For this week, you can keep up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. And if you have any comments or questions for the team or anything you'd like them to look into, Simon. Well, firstly, you should also bear in mind that not a single thing I said in this podcast constitutes individual financial Absolutely. advice. This is me talking in general terms about investing and saving. And that is the case of anything we talk about in this podcast. Um, but you can email us at editor at thisismoney.co.uk. You can tweet us at thisismoney and you come to thisismoney.co.uk forward slash podcast to find all podcasts past. Marvellous. And if you like our podcast, why not rate us wherever you found us? It helps other people find us too. Don't forget, you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the Digest and Invest podcast by Etoro. Go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go. Digest and Invest by Etoro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing.